Yes, we are live on the air. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Home Food Safety Myth Busters Debunking Common Food Safety Misperceptions webinar with the Partnership for Food Safety Education. We're also glad... The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Home Food Safety Mythbusters webinar. My name is Margot Bolin, and I am the Manager of Programs and Outreach for the Partnership for Food Safety Education. We're also glad you could be with us today. We think we have a really great presentation for you, as well as we're able to offer credit, continuing professional edu education credit today. If at any time anyone has a question, please feel free to type in a question on the question function that you should see on your dashboard on the left si or the right side of your screen. And we will uh, proceed and begin the webinar. Um, first, I want to take care of a couple housekeeping items. As I mentioned, we offer uh, continuing professional education credits from both the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics as well as NEHA. Those certificates will be available on the partnership's website at fightback.org later on this afternoon. Um, so what you would need to do if you want to claim those credits is visit our website later on today. Um, and you may also ask questions at any point in the webinar uh, by typing them in on the question function on your dashboard you should see on the right side of the screen. Um, we will try to get to just as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Um, but if something pops in your head during a particular part of the presentation, please just uh, go ahead and type out your question while you still remember it. About this webinar, um, this is our fourth year of doing Mythbusters with the Partnership for Food Safety Education. And why we do this is um, we think that there are a lot of food safety myths out there. They're born of tradition and a misapplication or a, a misunderstanding of science. Um, they may be spread through families or community culture, um, or they may even make their way around the Internet reaching millions of people. Um, we think we have a really great list of four new myths and facts this year that we'll be presenting. Uh, in this presentation, leaders in the food safety field will debunk the four common food safety myths. The material should be advanced enough for registered dietitians and will approach food safety myths from a microbiological perspective. Um, at the end of the webinar, you will also receive an email that will guide you to all of the great free tools and resources on home food safety mythbusters that you're um, able to use for free uh, in your classrooms or however you might like to use them in your, your teaching and education efforts in food safety. We have four wonderful presenters today. As I said, I'm the moderator, Margo Bolin. I'm the manager of outreach and programs for the Partnership for Food Safety Education. We also have on the line uh, John Allen, the director of regulatory affairs at the American Frozen Food Institute. We have Dr. David Gombas with us, who's the vice president or the senior vice president of food safety and technology with the United Fresh Produce Association. Dr. Judy Harrison, professor of foods and nutritionist from the University of Georgia and Dr. Callie Neal, Associate Professor of Food Parasitology at the University of Delaware. We're very happy all of our presenters could be with us today. They have a wealth of knowledge, and feel free to ask questions of them and really call on their expertise at any time. A little bit about the Partnership for Food Safety Education. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Fight Back campaign and probably the Mythbusters campaign. We're a nonprofit public-private partnership we focus exclusively on the prevention of foodborne illness at the point of consumer handling and preparation in the home. Our goal is to deliver trusted, science-based behavioral health messaging and resources to support consumers and health educators in their efforts to reduce the risk of foodborne illness. Our mission is to end illness and death from foodborne infections in the United States, and we hope that everyone on the line will, is uh, helping to contribute and wants to be a part of our joint mission. So with that, we will begin the presentation of the myths and facts. And we will begin with a presentation from Dr. Neal. Um, Dr. Neal, if you'd like to begin. Yes, great. Well, welcome, everyone. Glad you're able to join us. Our first myth today is 
if I microwave the food, the microwaves kill the bacteria so the food is safe. And on the right, you see a picture of a microwave, which may look very much like your home microwave, something that we all probably have a lot of practice with. Next slide, please. Actually, this is not true. And the fact is that microwaves are not what kill the bacteria. It's the heat generated by the microwave that kill the bacteria in food. And the food needs to be heated to a safe internal temperature. In fact, there have been many instances of foodborne illness associated with the consumption of undercooked foods that were likely improperly heated using a microwave. One example of this that you may have seen in the media or may have heard about was in 2007 when over 400 cases of salmonella infections were associated with not ready to eat microwavable hot pot pies that had not been microwaved properly. So let's start off by talking a little bit about how a microwave works. And this may be a product in our home kitchens that we take for granted. Microwaving is actually heating with a form of low energy radiation in the form of electromagnetic waves. Now, that may sound a little bit dangerous, but it's really not. And I'm hoping that this image will show that. Many things that we use every day use radiation to work, as you can see here. In fact, electromagnetic waves, as their terms, gives us the meaning that they both have an electric and a magnetic component, similar to waves generated from cell phones or radio waves. And on the next slide, you can see that a microwave is actually composed of many, many important parts, all contained within this small oven. The magnetron is actually where the microwaves are generated, inside the metal oven. And that's where the waves of non-ionizing radiation would be generated, sent out. Then using this waveguide, you can see they would be dispersed through the oven in a fairly uniform manner. And then they would be reflected off the sides of the oven, which are metal, and then absorbed by the food. Next slide, please. Now what's important is that the microwaves that will be generated will be reflected by metal. And they will actually pass through most different types of materials that we use to heat food products, like glass, paper, or plastic. And producers are very careful in the design of materials that are used to contain food for microwaving. In fact, this technology is changing all the time. So while the containers that we use for the food, will, the microwaves will pass through those, they will be absorbed by the food. And it's, this is the energy that is going to be used to help heat the food product. And we'll see how that works on the next slide. Heating of the food occurs as the microwaves actually pass into the food and water molecules in the food start to get excited and they start to move around quickly. Their quick movements are in response to changes in the electric field as water is a very unique type of molecule. It has both positive and negative charges and we can call that a dipolar molecule. And it's actually those two charges that allow it to be excited and to move back and forth. And as they vibrate, the food will actually start to get hot. And it's heating the food by the vibrations of the water molecules inside the food without heating the air around it. So it's the ability for water to be such a neat and unique molecule that allows this to happen. On the next slide, you can also see in this image, again, reinforcing how the microwaves will bounce off the surfaces, especially the metal in the oven, then be absorbed by the food that has these ex water molecules that get excited in the food and then can generate heat that would be used in cooking the food and in killing off the bacteria that may be present in the food. Next slide, please. There are some differences between cooking in your microwave and cooking in a conventional oven, for example. In a microwave, the molecules react largely from the surface inward so that the temperature gradient may be formed. And microwaves only penetrate one to two inches in this area that's heated, which may be uniform and quick in that one area, but perhaps only in that area and not spread out through the food. So that could result in cold pockets. 
also in microwaving, there's no surface browning because of the lack of intense heat on the exterior of the food. So there's no surface browning like you might see in your conventional oven. And foods heat differently. On the next slide, you may see maybe a product you had for breakfast, perhaps. If, you, if you've ever tried to warm up a jelly donut in the microwave, you realize quite quickly that the jelly inside is so hot that you may burn your tongue. But when you handled the product, it was fairly cool. And that's because different foods heat differently. The sugary jelly heated up very quickly, whereas the more dense, dry coating and outside of the donut was fairly cool to your touch. Now, sometimes that can actually be um, changed a little bit if you allow the food to rest a little bit and permit the heat to travel from the hot regions of the food to the cooler ones. But it's still the main fact that the foods will be heated differently from the microwave. And something to keep in mind is that dense foods, such as meat, especially when thicker than one inch, may take more time to be able to have enough sufficient heat throughout the product. So in terms of microwaving, here are some food for thought. There may be non-uniform distribution of water in the food. Remember that water is a dipolar molecule that are going to get excited and be responsible for generating the heat in the food. This can lead to non-uniform heat distribution or areas of cold or hot spots in your food. There may be differences in frozen or thawed areas of one food pot. And there may be areas within a microwave oven that may have high or low microwave field strength. And that's something to keep in mind with your own particular microwave oven. So it's of the utmost importance to follow instructions on the package. That includes rotating and stirring foods during the cooking process if the instructions call for it also allowing that resting time before you dive into the food. It's also essential to check the temperature of microwave foods with a food thermometer in several spots, and you'll hear more about this later on this webinar. Also note that some foods should not be microwaved at all, and that's noted on the package. In fact, over the past two to three years, many producers have developed clearer and unique packaging labels to represent when a food should not be microwaved. Again, we've seen cases of foodborne illness that have been associated with undercooking of foods or improper microwaving of foods that should not have been microwaved at all. This has been seen with one type of food product, which is a pre-browned, ready-to-cook chicken product that is raw and should not be microwaved. So that's clearly indicated on those labels. Be sure to look for those. The take-home message is that microwaves are not what kill bacteria that may be in your food. It's actually the heat that's generated by the microwave that kills the bacteria in the food. Many of us rely on microwaves as time savers, but we need to be sure that the foods are heated to a safe internal temperature. The foods can cook unevenly because they are shaped irregularly or may vary in thickness. Remember, even in that same food product, this could be true. And even with a microwave, that has a turntable, foods may still cook unevenly and leave cold spots in the food. So the best bet is to remember to keep the heat on, check for a safe internal temperature after microwaving using your thermometer. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Neal. That was a wonderful overview of the first myth and facts with some good evidence to back it up. At this time, we're going to take on our first um, we would like to know what you think about this on the line. The best way to wash raw, fresh fruits and vegetables is A, by using a cleaning agent like soap, B, by rinsing them under running water, or C, by soaking them in a tub. So we'll take just a second and see what you all think. We have 54% that have voted, and now that's going up to 60%. So I'll leave it open for just one more second before I report the results.
Now we're up to 79%. And by and large, you all are a smart crowd. You have said the correct answer, B, by rinsing them under running water. A few people thought that a cleaning agent like soap might be the best way, but we'll see in a moment from Dr. David Gomez why that is not the case. So, Dr. Gomez, I will hand it over to you to explain our second myth and fact about pre-washed bagged lettuce and greens. Thank you, Margo, and hello to everybody. This is David Gombas with the United Fresh Produce Association. And the second myth we're going to talk about today is, of course, I wash all the bag lettuce and greens. Like, I could get sick if I don't. But the reality is, the fact, is that while it's important to wash most fresh fruits and vegetables, just like you've, uh, you've recognized in the poll just before, packaged greens are special. Those that are labeled ready to eat or washed or triple washed or similar type of the wording do not need to be washed at home. Why? We'll go to the next slide, Margo. In 2007, this was brief. This was shortly after the E. coli outbreaks that were linked to lettuce, leafy greens in 2006. There was a lot of speculation in the media about, well, should people be washing their salads? Would that make it safer? Would it, would it be better for consumers? And a panel of 13 food safety experts from across the U.S. and Canada was convened to consider that, uh, that advice. And they sat down and looked at how leafy greens are produced and how consumers might handle leafy greens in the home. And they thought about what is the best advice to give to consumers. So much of what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes comes from this publication that is on your screen right now. And anyone can download that publication. I believe it's open for anybody to download at any time. It's got a lot of great information. And you can see the entire thought process of that expert panel. But I'm going to give you some just brief notes on it. First thing they considered was, how are leafy greens produced? And they learned that leafy greens, for especially for those brands that are well recognized, leafy greens are grown and harvested under good agricultural practices. There's been a lot of thought and effort that's gone into what are good agricultural practices, particularly for leafy greens. And those practices have become quite mature. So if it is a reputable brand out there, they have looked at all the inputs for how those leafy greens have been produced and how they've been harvested and how workers have been trained the source of the water and various other potential risk factors. So when these leafy greens are harvested, they're about as clean as they could ever be. Once they come into the facility that where they're going to be processed into salads, they're also professionally trimmed, cored, and then chopped using people who are well trained on, on what to look for, how to get rid of inedible portions of lettuce and leafy greens and also to get rid of anything that may be damaged or dirty. Then it's professionally chopped using usually uh, uh, automated equipment that's been designed to make it as efficient as possible. The chopped lettuce goes into a wash system. Now they may be washed once, twice, and sometimes three times. Those are the ones that are called triple washed. The first wash removes any remaining dirt that might be on the leafy greens and also the juices from cutting. When you cut lettuce, as you know, the, the, there's juices that come out of the lettuce. And you want to make sure you get rid of that so we don't give any remaining bacteria something to grow on. So that's what the first wash does. And sometimes that wash will get a little dirty over time, just like it does in your kitchen. So they go into a second wash, another bath of, of, of clean water. And both of these washes tend to be flumes. There's a lot of agitation to to wash the, the dirt off of the leafy greens. The third wash is frequently just a shower, a, a final rinse to get anything that still might be on there off. Now when they do this washing, the water itself removes about 90 to 99% of any of the bacteria that may be on the surface of the leafy greens. And that's important. There's a lot of speculation out there that it's the chlorine or other chemicals that are inside the with the wash water that are doing the, the removal of bacteria, killing the bacteria, and that's not the case. Reality is that the actual washing step gets rid of most of the bacteria. After it's washed, then they are dried. 
usually it's a, some form of spin drying to, to take the water off because when the leafy greens go into the package, which is the final step, they don't want any water pooling at the bottom of the bag. So if you ever see a bag of salad that has a pool of water at the bottom, better not to buy it or throw it away if you have it in your refrigerator already because that just means that that product is going to be spoiling a lot faster. The best salads don't have any water pooled at the bottom. Okay, if we can go on to the next slide, Margo. In the fresh cut operation where these salads are manufactured, all that equipment that is used, I've described already the washing, the cutting, the trimming equipment, and all the tools that the workers use have been cleaned and sanitized to federal standards every day or often, more often. So, and the workers have also been well trained on how to handle leafy greens and these utensils safely. When we talk about the wash water, it always contains an antimicrobial. And that antimicrobial may be chlorine as hypochlorous acid or chlorine dioxide. Ozone is sometimes used. Peroxyacetic acid, which smells a little like vinegar, uh, has been used. And there's other types of antimicrobials out there. All of these antimicrobials are monitored and controlled in the wash water to federal standards. There's not much in there. It's not in there with the intent of removing or killing the bacteria uh, that's on the, on the produce. It's in there to ensure that there's no cross-contamination from any contaminated produce that may be in the water to other uncontaminated produce. We want to avoid any cross-contamination by bacteria or by pa any pathogens that might be on the produce. It's not a kill step, and that's very, very important. By the time the product is done going through the wash step and the drying step and in the package, it is as clean as it can be. It's been professionally clean, professional equipment, by uh, the most up-to-date technologies available. So rewashing that product once you get it into the home, not likely to re remove much more. Move on to the next slide, Margo. So, oh, but now this is important. What I've been talking about so far is washed ready-to-eat salads. It is important to read the label because not all bagged leafy greens are ready to eat. If it is ready to eat, the, ba the package will say triple wash, wash, ready to eat, or some similar language. If it doesn't say that, then it is important to wash those leafy greens before eating, just like any fresh fruit or vegetable. Next slide, Margo. So what about in consumers' homes? What happens there? Well, just like in the fresh cut processing operation, washing in plain running tap water removes up to 90 and 90 percent of bacteria. It works as effectively in the home as it does in the, in the uh, professional operations. But I say up to 90 and 99 percent of bacteria. If you've already washed it off in those fresh cut salads, you're not going to be washing off much more. You're never going to get to 100 percent and continuing to wash the leafy greens isn't going to make the, the product any cleaner. Now, there's also the question about consumer produce wash solutions. And, for, and as I hear, most of you folks recognize washing plain water is the best approach. There was a recent paper published just uh, last month in the Food Protection Trends, and the citations down below, that concluded that washing it in water, washing the leafy green or any kind of fresh produce in water is probably the best approach. Uh, many of the in-home solutions for washing fresh produce really are not reliable, and they're not going to give you much more of a reduction in bacteria, let alone pathogens, than just plain running water. Further, in-house mis mishandling of fruits and vegetables, or washing, or any kind of ready-to-eat food is a leading cause of foodborne disease. So we only want consumers handling the food if they can actually do good things by that handling, and doing things that are not going to be helpful just creates an opportunity for mishandling and, and actually making things worse. So, Margo, let's go to the next slide. What should consumers do, either with leafy greens that have not been pre-washed or other fresh fruits and vegetables? First, of course, make sure your hands are not going to be a source of contamination, thoroughly washing them with soap and warm water. 
then anything else that might be a source of contamination, the sink, the colanders, salad spinners, any utensils, anything else that may come in contact with the lettuce, leafy greens, or other fruits and vegetables, clean them with hot soapy water, rinse them off before using. Then use cold running water to wash the ready-to-eat lettuce, leafy green salads. Then, after they've been washed, drying them. And if they, because again, you don't want wet lettuce. You want to have them uh, as dry as, as uh, possible for eating. But if they are dry, use a clean salad spinner. So you do a spin dry just like they do in the professional operations. Or a paper towel, not a cloth towel or a towel that has been used for something else, because that's a great way to contaminate those leafy greens. If we go back one more, I just want to wrap that one up. Never use detergent or bleach. That's not what they've been designed to do. So again, cold running water is the best uh, approach to washing leafy greens. Okay, now we can go forward. So the expert panel back in 2007 came to the conclusion that while it's important to thoroughly wash most fresh fruits and vegetables, if packaged greens are labeled ready to eat, washed or triple washed, then the product does not need to be washed at home. The opportunity to do more harm than good is too great. And then always handle pre-washed greens with clean hands and make sure cutting boards, utensils, and countertops are clean. So the take-home message on this, on the next slide, is that if you're handling pre-washed greens, it is safer to avoid rewashing them as long as the label says pre-washed. And I think that's the last slide, Margo. I'll turn it back to you. And I'm not hearing you. Oh, there we go. There you go. Technical issue. There we go. Sorry for that interruption. I wanted to launch the second poll of the day. We want to know what everyone on the line thinks are some causes of coloration in raw or cooked meats and poultry. So if you'll take a second on your screen to vote. Is it A, different levels and forms of myoglobin, B, exposure to chemicals, C, pH level of the meat itself, D, the amount of water in the meat, or is it E, a combination of the above, A, C, and D? So if everyone on the line could take a moment and key in what you think is the correct answer. It looks like we have 45% who have submitted what they think and rising. And we'll give it another second to accumulate votes. And then we'll hear from Dr. Judy Harrison about what the correct answer is. So we have 80% who voted. And we have 15% who believe that it's different levels and forms of myoglobin. We have lesser percent to think pH and water. Um, we have overwhelmingly 80% who think it's a combination of the above, that it's different levels and forms of myoglobin, as well as the pH level of the meat and amount of water in the meat. So it's all of these things except for exposure to chemicals. So we'll hear why in just one moment from uh, Dr. Harrison of the University of Georgia, and she'll walk us through this myth and fact about the coloration of meat. We know it's an area of, of confusion for a lot of different consumers. So Dr. Harrison, if you'd like to take over. Thank you, Margo. Uh, myth number three in our 2012 Mythbusters is, I don't need to use a food thermometer. I can tell when my food is cooked by looking at it or checking the temperature with my finger. And on the next slide, we will see that the fact is, the only way, the only sure way to know food is safely cooked is to check the temperature with a food thermometer and confirm that it's reached a safe internal temperature. And we'll go to the next slide. On this slide, we're going to see three supporting facts 
about this um, myth and fact. Color and texture are not indicators that a food is safe to eat. The second one is that steaming of foods during cooking is not an indicator that the food is safe to eat. And the third supporting fact is that temperature must be measured by a food thermometer. Now let's take a look at the scientific basis about why these are true. Why is it that color and texture cannot be used to indicate when a food is safely cooked? Well, there have been some studies that have looked at the color of ground meats during cooking. And these studies showed that some meat turns brown before it reaches 160 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature that's needed to destroy harmful microorganisms or pathogens like E. coli 0157H7. And this condition where meat turns brown before it reaches that temperature is referred to as premature browning. Some meat actually stays pink after it reaches 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And that condition is referred to as persistent pink. So if you look at the hamburger patty on the left side of the screen, that patty is brown in the center. Would you say that that patty is safe to eat? No, because the internal temperature of that particular patty has not reached 160 degrees Fahrenheit. That's an example of premature browning. Now, if you look at the patty on the right of the screen, the center of that particular patty looks pink. But that one has reached a temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's an example of persistent pink color. Now, what causes these conditions? Let's go to the next slide. One very big factor is the protein in the muscle that carries oxygen. And that protein is called myoglobin. Myoglobin can be present in different amounts in meat, and it can be in different forms in the meat. Meat that's freshly slaughtered will have a purple-red color, like the photo you see on the left side of your screen, because the interior of the animal has limited exposure to oxygen. So that's what produces that purple-red color of the myoglobin. Now, when the meat is exposed to air and oxygen, then the myoglobin changes form to give us the bright red color that you see in the middle photo. As meat ages, the myoglobin can change and cause a brown color to develop. Also, the level of acidity in a product or the pH of that meat um, can affect the color as well. And then, and then the amount of water that's present in meat can also affect the color and the texture of the product. And this is especially true with pork. Some pork is referred to as being pale, soft, and exudative, meaning that it has more moisture. And then other pork can be dark, firm, and dry. So the bottom line is that all these factors affect the color and the texture of the product so that we cannot use color and texture as a reliable indicator that a safe temperature has been reached. All right, let's go to the next slide, Margot. The second reason we need to use thermometers is that steaming of foods during cooking is not an indicator that the food is safe to eat. The outside can be steaming and hot, but there may be cold spots inside the food. And this is especially true if you're cooking a food from a frozen state without first thawing it. The outside will heat up quickly, but the inside may still be frozen or thawing and heating at an uneven rate. This can also be true um, when you're cooking in a microwave oven. And as Dr. Neal mentioned earlier, um, food sometimes cooks unevenly in a microwave oven. And that's why we teach people to cover, rotate, and stir foods um, as a method for getting them to heat more evenly when you're cooking in a microwave. 
All right, let's go to the next one. Temperature must be measured by a food thermometer. Now, using a food thermometer ensures that a food has reached a high enough temperature to destroy the harmful pathogens that might be present in the food. And it also ensures that a food is not overcooked because overcooking can actually diminish the quality of the product. So the bottom line is using a food thermometer takes the guesswork out of cooking. All right, next slide. So are people really using food thermometers? There was a study published by the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at FDA just this year in the Journal of Food Protection. And their study indicated that the percent of consumers who own thermometers has increased from 49% in 1998 up to about 70% in 2010. And in their study, they found that 82% of the people reported that they used thermometers to measure temperature when they're cooking roast, but only about 53% of them use thermometers to measure temperature when they're cooking chicken parts. And even fewer, only about a fourth of the people, measured the temperature of hamburgers during cooking. So there really is still a lot of educating to be done. Next slide. Now, I know that all of you are measuring the temperature of your hamburger patty. But let's say you check it and you find out that it's not done. So you just lay the thermometer aside, and then a few minutes later, you go back and you check it again, right? Well, wrong. If you do that, you may recontaminate the cooked meat. So there are some important tips to follow when you're using food thermometers. They need to be cleaned with soap and water after each use, and they need to be calibrated periodically for accuracy, especially if you're like me and you drop them all the time. All right, next slide. USDA has some excellent resources on types of thermometers and on how to use food thermometers. And this website that we're displaying is a good one for you to go to to get more information on using food thermometers. You can also just go to the FSIS website and search for food, food thermometers and access these resources that way as well. Next slide. So remember, no matter how hot a food may feel on the outside, Bacteria can still be on the inside. Next slide. So it's a fact, the only sure way to know that food is safely cooked is to check the temperature with a food thermometer and confirm that it's reached a safe internal temperature. So Margo, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Harrison. That was some great detail especially about food thermometer use and trends. Um, I'd like to take a second to remind everyone that if you have a question that pops into your head as we're moving through the presentation, please feel free to type it in on the question box that should appear on your dashboard on the right side of your screen. Um, we'll now proceed with our fourth and final myth about freezing foods, which is an area of confusion for a lot of consumers. And I will hand it over to John Allen from the American Frozen Food Institute to take us through our final myth and fact. Okay, thank you very much, Margo. Um, as mentioned, uh, I'm John Allen. I'm with the uh, American Frozen Food Institute. I'm the Director of Regulatory and International Affairs. And so I'm going to be tackling myth number four today, which is uh, that I, I can't refreeze foods after I have already thawed them, I must cook them or either throw them away. Can you please move to the next slide? The reality, though, is that, in fact, if foods such as meat, poultry, egg products, and seafood have been thawed in the refrigerator, and that's key, um, thawed, thawing in the refrigerator, then they may actually uh, be thawed safely 
um, and refrozen without using uh, without cooking for later use. And this really applies to, to foods that have been previously cooked uh, before as well. So if you're taking leftovers that you just cooked and you store them in the freezer and then you refall them uh, in the refrigerator, uh, then those could be safely refrozen again. Next slide, please. So again, if, if raw foods um, have been thawed in the refrigerator, uh, then they may be safely refrozen without cooking for later use. Uh, it's important that you never thaw raw foods by letting them sit on the kitchen counter. Uh, now there's no real safety concerns with the refreezing uh, of these foods. Um, the, the real concern, uh, as from a consumer point of view, is really in quality changes. Uh, with repeated freezing and then thawing uh, of foods, you can get uh, significant decreases in quality. Um, this is because during the freezing process, uh, you get ice crystal formation within the cells of the food. And because of that crystallization of ice, you can get buildup in highly concentrated areas of, uh, of, extra, of still remaining water and you get a lot of high concentration of salts and other solutes. Um, and then during the thawing process, water from uh, ice crystals melts and then it can rush back into the cellular structures causing uh, the bursting of the cells and then release of a lot of nutrients. Uh, and with that loss and breakage of tissues, you can get significant leaching of water um, out of the food and uh, potential losses of vitamins and nutrients with that loss of, of water in the cellular structure. Um, in addition, with that uh, leaching process with the freeze-thaw cycles, uh, you can get mushiness and loss of the integrity of the food so that your, your vegetables become mushy, uh, lose their firmness, uh, so of course it's not necessarily appetizing for consumers. Uh, but again, again, that's quality losses with repeated freezing and thawing of foods. Um, so no real con safety concerns if you're thawing them in the refrigerator. However, as the next point addresses, if, if raw foods are thawed outside of the refrigerator, for example in the microwave oven or under cool running water, they should be cooked immediately. Uh, never refreeze raw or fully cooked foods that have been thawed outside of the refrigerator. And Margo, if you go on to the next slide, I will explain why. So the scientific basis behind these recommendations are that thawing foods in temperatures above refrigeration temperature, outside of the refrigeration, outside of the refrigerator, which is uh, generally above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, can allow any pathogens that might be present in that food, uh, which could particularly be the case in, in raw meats, poultry, seafood, those type of products, uh, could allow those pathogens um, to start multiplying and potentially also producing toxins. So therefore, cooking these foods uh, that have been thawed outside of refrigeration temperature, which would control and, and prohibit in most cases, uh, multiplication and toxin production by bacteria. Uh, cooking these foods is critical to, to eliminate any increased uh, levels of pathogens that might have developed um, in sections of food. So if you think of a, a chicken breast, for example, you take it out of the freezer, you put it into your refrigerator, or, or out not, not in the refrigerator, but you're, let's say you're thawing it in the microwave oven. Uh, you thaw it, defrost cycle for a couple minutes. Um, you may have noticed personally that uh, through your own experience that the edges of the product may become, start turning white and get warm and even in some cases hot, whereas the center of that chicken breast may still have ice and be frozen solid. So uh, if you take that product that's been thawed in the refrigerator or, or excuse me, the microwave, um, you now have a warm portion which is ideal for microbial growth, whereas the internal part of that would be frozen and there's, of course, no organisms necessarily there in the center of the chicken breast, but those are not going to grow anyways. So anyways, <clears throat> so the point, that's uh, 
why it's so important to go ahead and cook those foods immediately so that any pathogens that, that have been allowed some time to start growing or producing toxins on the outside surface of these foods uh, would be killed through, the, the, through a real uh, cooking step. So if you go on the next slide. So the, the takeaway message is that um, in general, uh, for most consumer purposes, it's, it's always best to remember to thaw foods in the refrigerator, if at all possible. And again, as mentioned previously, if, if for the sake of time purposes, you don't have the time to thaw something in the refrigerator and you do use a microwave or cold running water uh, to thaw a product, that for those circumstances that you do go ahead and cook them immediately and don't attempt to refreeze those products and because it's an additional thaw cycle after that could allow those um, organisms to, to further multiply and produce toxins which could, which could set the consumer up for uh, illness. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. That's great. I can see on my dashboard here that that provoked a lot of questions. Um, so we'll be sure to get to those in a minute. I just want to draw people's attention to the different Mythbusters resources that today's webinar are based on. Um, they're all available for free at fightback.org, which is probably how you came to this webinar in the first place. It's at www.fightbac.org. You'll also be getting an email that will be sent around about an hour after the webinar with links to all of the Mythbusters materials as well as information about where you can find your continuing professional education credits and a link to our YouTube page where we will have this video um, available uh, for the long-term foreseeable future for use um, however you might like. I know a couple people on the line have asked questions about using it in a serve safe environment or using it to educate others and that is um, perfectly fine to do. It will be available on our YouTube and all of these links will be sent to you in an email later on this afternoon. Um, I've also had a few questions about people who would like to use these slides in the future and they will be posted on the fightback.org website. That will also be a link in the email you'll receive. So you'll get one big email with lots and lots of information. I would encourage you to look through that to get information about continuing professional agent education credits, the availability of the slides, and the video of the webinar. Um, I've also had a question from a participant about submitting ideas for myths, and we always love to hear about ideas for myths um, because you all are the ones who are working out in the field and come across you know, misconceptions that may, might be long held that we haven't addressed yet, so we would love to hear about that. Um, in the email that you'll get, there will be a um, an email address uh, where you can send any ideas you might have. Um, additionally, we always love to hear stories from the field, and we may even post them on our uh, Backfighter Field Report blog, um, and you'll have a link for that as well to submit your story if you've worked with Mythbusters in the past and it's worked really well, or you used it in a unique way or if you just use, use it habitually throughout the year, not just even for um, September being National Food Safety Education Month. We would love to hear about that. So again, this is the uh, website uh, fightback.org where you can find all of the Mythbusters materials as well as the slides and information about continuing professional education credits. And here is the link to um, what I was speaking about to uh, post a field report on your food safety education activity. We would love to showcase that. We have um, a blog that we update a couple times a month with new stories from the field, people like you who are doing this work in the field to reduce risk of foodborne illness. Um, so we do have a whole bunch of questions. If anyone else has a question that they would like to submit, I'm going to start reading through them and we'll hopefully get to as many as we can in the time that we have um, about different food safety issues. And I see that we do have a lot uh, popping up. So I will start with a question from Susan Budd. She asked, do salad spinners affect 
the food safety of green. So, David, maybe if you'd like to answer that one. Yes, it could, and it's very important to uh, to make sure that that salad spinner is as clean as any other kind of utensil that might come in contact with the fresh produce. Uh, it, the salad spinner itself doesn't make the salad any cleaner, but it could be a source of contamination if it has not been cleaned and sanitized properly. Great. Thank you for that answer. I hope that answers the question. Um, we have another question about microwaving foods. <laughs> Um, the participant asked, what container is the best to use to microwave foods? Is it dangerous to use plastic containers in microwaving? And I know a lot of consumers have this concern. Um, Dr. Neal or anyone on the line, um, do you have experience with this issue? Sure, I would recommend that um, using a container that would be properly labeled for microwaving Certainly now you see so many different materials that are labeled as um, BPA-free, for example, as, as one potential contaminant that has been found in, in plastics. Certainly it's also good to keep in mind that the real hazards that may be posed from some different agents, chemical agents that could be in plastics, have to do with really a very high heat and prolonged exposure. Uh, but I know there are many, many thoughts, and many of these have emotional basis as well, in terms of not microwaving in styrofoam or in different types of plastics. So I would recommend using labels, reading the labels, and using something, um, if best always, to go with something like a glass container if you're really concerned about it. Great. So Dr. Harrison, I have a comment. Uh, I just would say, add to what Dr. Neal said that um, making sure that you use, uh, if you are going to use plastic containers, that they are labeled for use in the microwave. Great. Thank you both. Um, our next question concerns food thermometers. We've had several questions about the use of food thermometers. Um, what if your food thermometer does not come with calibration instructions? Do they all need to be calibrated? Well, actually, when you're purchasing a food thermometer, it's a good idea to look for those that do have um, ways listed on the package to be calibrated. If you're using um, the dial gauge, for instance, they should have a calibration nut underneath that dial gauge so that you can use um, that in order to calibrate it. Many of the digital thermometers will simply have a button that you push to recalibrate that thermometer. So when you purchase the thermometer, that's when you should look to make sure that the brand that you're getting is one that can be calibrated. Because otherwise, you really don't have a way of knowing if that thermometer is still reading accurately. And they will change if you drop them or, um, you know, if they're damaged in some way. So it is a good idea to always look for ones that you can calibrate. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another question that came in about how to best sanitize a food thermometer. And this question is, can you sanitize a food thermometer with an alcohol wipe? Is that a good food safety practice for sanitizing your food thermometer? Well, alcohol, of course, is a sanitizer. I mean, it does um, destroy harmful microorganisms. It's not as effective as chlorine uh, because you do have to let alcohol stand a little longer than chlorine in order to have that same uh, kill step. Um, I would recommend just sanitizing it with a chlorine bleach solution, and we typically recommend one tablespoon per gallon of water, that ratio, to use as a sanitizing solution. Great. That's really helpful. Um, we have a question that came in about refreezing um, for John. Uh, does the fact of refreezing also apply in a healthcare setting? I guess that means, can you um, re can you defrost in a refrigerator? 
and John, I'll let you talk a little bit about that. Um, sure. I think um, in a healthcare setting where you have patients that are could be potentially more susceptible, they could have uh, uh, compromised immune systems. Um, yeah, it's something to be aware of. You definitely don't want to keep things in the refrigerator, um, even refrigerated products, uh, for too long because you do have potential for pathogens such as Listeria monocytogenes, which can grow at refrigeration temperatures. Uh, could be there within the refrigerator itself, on the surfaces, um, or it could be on the food or in, in the food itself and can um, possibly grow uh, in that food item over a series of days. So it's important to always have a good first in, first out type of practice, uh, good practices with uh, storing foods in refrigerators uh, where pathogens such as listeria can grow. Um, so you have to keep use those same type of practices with foods that have been thawed. Of course, in the freezer temperatures, uh, pathogens cannot grow and multiply or produce toxins. So when you do go take that item and put it in the refrigerator, then you might have some chances for uh, listeria in particular to begin growing. So again, minimize the number of t the, the amount of time, the number of days that you keep products stored at refrigeration temperatures just for that for that specific reason. Great, thank you for that. Um, we had a question that came in about uh, washing uh, uncut fruit such as watermelons and cantaloupes. And this is a very current issue, something that's been in the news. So Dr. Gomez, if you would like to comment on what people should do with um, with fruits that have a hard rind, such as watermelons and cantaloupes. Okay, very good. And the, yes, washing any kind of fruit or vegetable that has not been pre-washed is important to do. Again, doing it exactly the same way, though, doing it under cold running water and making sure that your hands have been washed and, and, uh, and are as clean as possible. And anything else that the fruit or vegetable may come in contact, whether it's a, a sink counter or a cutting board or anything else. But uh, washing, just washing under cold running water. Now, with hard fruits and vegetables like a rinded melon, uh, you can use a brush. And brushing is a good way of cleaning them as well. Cucumbers or melons, uh, uh, even uh, apples and things like that, things that are hard enough that they can tolerate brushing. Brushing uh, will also dislodge and remove any other kinds of things that might be sticking to the fruit or vegetable. But be careful about that because when you're using that brush, that brush can harbor bacteria just like other kinds of reusable tools. So you want to make sure that brush is, is, is clean enough and is not going to become a source of contamination. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question now that I think relates to um, the myth about uh, cooking raw foods. What about eating raw fish like mahi-mahi and poke? Are people who eat these foods just putting themselves at a higher risk of foodborne illness. So Dr. Harrison, if you'd like to comment on that briefly. Well, certainly, um, if you were a person who was at risk for foodborne illness, uh, very young children, elderly, uh, people who already have their immune system compromised in some way, such as maybe they're on therapy for uh, chemotherapy for cancer treatment or they've had an organ transplant or pregnant women. Um, you know, those people are certainly going to be more at risk for eating uh, raw meat and raw fish than, than others. Of course, if you're purchasing certain uh, sashimi grade fish, those have been frozen um, in order to eliminate some risks of pathogens and that sort of parasites and that sort of thing. But if you're an at-risk audience, um, you know, you must understand that that is risky um, to eat raw meats or raw fish. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question now that pertains to frozen foods for John. Um, is it safe to refreeze frozen foods that are pre-cooked, like chicken nuggets, or does it apply only to raw foods like ground beef? 
So I think they're asking, for example, if you take chicken nuggets that are frozen out of the freezer, put them in your refrigerator, is it then safe to put them back in the freezer at that time? Yes. Uh, generally, yes, it is uh, safe to refreeze them. Um, and as I mentioned in my last answer, it's the, the same uh, carefulness have to, have, you have to uh, take care of to when you then re rethaw them the second time uh, that you don't let them sit in the refrigerator uh, for extended amounts of time. Um, now, a, a previously cooked product like a chicken nugget, uh, there's going to be probably very little risk that you're going to have a pathogen like listeria monocytogenes present in that food. So the chances that after a second period of sitting in the refrigerator uh, at refrigeration temperatures that there's a pathogen there that will likely start growing and multiplying to, to high enough numbers to cause illness is probably relatively low. Uh, so I think there's a very generally speaking a low risk with, with previously cooked foods, fully cooked foods. Now uncooked foods or partially cooked foods that have been frozen and then thawed uh, repeatedly uh, when stored at refrigeration temperatures you can get um, additional growth on that second period in the refrigeration um, and in the refrigerator so there you could have chances for those bacteria to grow over time um, and potentially cause illness. Great, thank you for that. Uh, we have just time for one or two more questions because we're a little bit over time. Um, but we have such good questions, I want to get a couple more in. Um, we have a question about organic vegetables. Um, this person asks, is an organic vegetable still in need of washing in the way that was described on the webinar? And the answer is yes. Um, organic vegetables are just as susceptible to uh, contamination as conventionally grown vegetables. Uh, there's really the studies that have been done comparing the safety of organic and conventionally grown indicate they're about the same. There's really not much difference. All of them are being grown with the safest procedures possible, but all of them are still grown out in the air, out in the fields, where wind and animals can bring things that are not within the farmer's control. So yes, if it's a whole unwashed fresh fruit or vegetable, whether it's conventional or organic, it's still important to wash. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for just one last question, and it pertains to food thermometers. Uh, where and how far should a food thermometer be inserted into food to get an accurate reading? And I think that's something that a lot of consumers are, are unsure of. Well, that's a good question, and it really varies depending on the particular thermometer that you have. Um, if you are using a dial gauge thermometer and you look at the stem of the thermometer, usually about an inch to an inch and a half up on the stem, you're going to see a little um, indention or a little dent in that stem. And with those thermometers, that uh, point is called an immersion point, and you really need to insert the thermometer so that that entire um, reading area is inserted into the thickest part of the food. Um, on digital thermometers, uh, instant read thermometers, um, most of those will have just the tip of that thermometer stem as the sensing area. And so um, you can just simply insert that sensing area into the food, into the top of, of the food at the thickest part, and those should give you an accurate reading um, with, at that point. But you really Great, need to you. look at the thermometer that you have. Depends on the food thermometer. So you would refer people to the USDA website that you had in your slides. For that yep. information further. Great. Well, great. Thank you to our, uh, our wonderful four presenters. I think they added a lot with their expertise. And thank you to everyone who's joined us on the line. Again, please look out for that email that's going to be sent around in about an hour with additional information, how to get the slides, how to get the video, 
um, how to secure your continuing professional education credits, as well as a link to the Mythbusters materials themselves. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And we look forward to having you at our next webinar in the future. Thanks a lot.